I'm Jen Moore, Music of the Baroque's program annotator, and welcome to Baroque Notes, our virtual pre-concert lecture series. And welcome also to our 52nd season in which we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of Dame Jane Glover's appointment as music director and Nicholas Kramer as principal guest conductor. I've been writing for Music of the Baroque since 1998, and this season encompasses so much of what I love about this ensemble. We're opening with Handel's very final masterpiece, Jephtha, a work we may well have introduced to Chicago in 1974. We're finally performing Bach's St. Matthew Passion for the first time since 2008, a monumental undertaking that we originally planned for our 50th season that was lost to the pandemic. We're working with world-renowned guest artists like countertenor Reginald Mobley, pianist Gabriela Montero, and guest conductor Patrick Quigley, and are collaborating for the first time with South Chicago Dance Theater. And our superlative orchestra and chorus will be on full display throughout the year. All the details are available at Baroque.org. Back to this edition of Baroque Notes, in which I will be discussing George Friedrich Handel's final oratorio, Jephthah. Handel arrived in London in 1710 as a well-known opera composer, but the main ingredients of the oratorio, ario recitatives, and great choruses were also stashed in his compositional suitcase. Oratorios were invented in 17th century Italy and were still popular a century later. Handel himself wrote two during his stay in the country in 1707 and 1708. At the turn of the 18th century, the genre was on the rise in Germany and England was soon to follow. In the summer of 1718, while working for James Bridges at Cannons in Edgware, Handel created two important dramatic works, the mask, Asus and Galatea, and the very first English oratorio, Esther. Although intended for private performance, Esther gradually came to the attention of the public, and in 1732, the work made its debut at the King's Theater in Haymarket. Initial impressions were decidedly mixed. As one anonymous author declared, I like the one good opera better than 20 oratorios. In many respects, however, the timing of the new English oratorio was ideal. Italian opera had been successful in London, but English audiences were beginning to tire of the industry, not to mention the singer's allegedly lascivious lifestyles, and Handel's own company was beginning to falter. The oratorio was a perfect replacement for opera. With English texts and familiar subject matter taken predominantly from the Bible, the works were much more accessible. Handel added just the right touch, the chorus, which for the first time was accorded a significant dramatic role. This potent combination of intelligibility, morality, and musical power was unbeatable and guaranteed Handel's fame in England forever. Fast forward to the summer of 1750, during which Handel was reportedly terribly hurt in a coach accident, according to the general advertiser. While well, subsequent correspondence makes no reference to any lingering injuries, Jane Glover notes in her book, Handel in London, that it did perhaps mark the beginning of a slow decline in Handel's health and activities. From that summer on, the routines established over many years were gradually abandoned. After it, everything became more laborious. Handel did not write any new music for over a year and finally began work on Jephtha in late 1751. Written by Thomas Morell, who also authored Judas Maccabeus, Theodora, and several other late oratorios, the libretto is based on the story of an Israelite chieftain, Jephtha, taken from Judges chapters 10 through 12. Tasked with liberating his people from the Ammonites, Jephtha makes a deal with God. If he is victorious, he will sacrifice the first living being he meets when he returns. Unfortunately, it is his daughter, Iphis, who greets him. Morel takes ownership of the narrative at this point, transforming an Old Testament tragedy into a tale of a merciful God. In the original story, Jephthah follows through on his vow. But in Morel's version, just as Jephthah resigns himself to killing his daughter, an angel suddenly appears, announcing that the Lord will spare Iphis as long as she remains dedicated to God in pure and virgin state forever. Morel also adds the characters of Hamor and Jephthah's wife, Storge, and interpolates texts by Milton, Pope, Addison, and others. While Morel shapes the story to fit a clearer narrative arc with a conflict and a relatively happy ending, at its heart, Jephthah is a story about human suffering, the suffering of the Israelites, the suffering of Jephthah and his wife, 
the suffering of Iphis, who had looked forward to a life with her partner, Hamor, and, as Jane Glover says, the suffering of Handel himself. We've been longing to do a Handel oratorio for many years, and the reason we chose Jephthah, which is actually Handel's last oratorio, and in my opinion, actually one of the very greatest, uh, is that it's intensely personal, uh, as well as bringing all those other dramatic skills and musical skills uh, to the table. Handel was um, going blind at the end of his life. Uh, this was a, something that happened to a lot of composers, not least Bach. Uh, and as it happens, they were both treated by the same quack doctor who failed to um, save both their sight. But this, of course, is a disaster for a musician. It was a disaster for Beethoven to be deaf, but it was a disaster also for Handel to be blind, because if you can't see to put notes on music, if you can't see to put notes on a page, uh, if you can't write, then you can't compose. And this became intolerable for him. And I think also there was some pain involved in his uh, eye disorder, because as he was writing Jephthah, uh, he had to stop uh, at the end of the second act and, and put it away for a few days, a few weeks actually, and then come back to it and start again. And in that what he is telling is the story of a very private struggle of Jephthah uh, with, uh, well, this vow he made to kill the first, to sacrifice the first person he saw if he survived the war and won the war, and of course it was his daughter. The consequences of this are therefore very painful for him. And uh, it's, the, the character of Jephthah is one of the most rounded of all that he wrote and of a very suffering uh, older man, which is sort of what Handel was at the time. The suffering, of course, is completely different. But we feel the pain of Jephthah in the pain of uh, Handel, or we feel the pain of Handel in the pain of Jephthah. Um, there, is, there are extraordinary human relationships throughout the piece. Jeff, the relation of Jephthah and his daughter, uh, the relationship between uh, Jephthah's wife, Storje, and her daughter. And therefore, when Jephthah announces uh, what he has done in choosing to sacrifice his daughter and the way his wife turns on him is so human. There are things to look out for. For instance, there's a quartet where four of them are all singing at the same time, but all completely different things as they describe their reactions to the vow that Jephthah has made. Oh, spare your daughter, spare thy child, my love, for it's man my vow, in heaven I, for thee is no existence. Oh, spare your daughter, spare thy child, my love, for it's man my It is in part two, the heart of the suffering, that Handel writes his finest music, in my opinion, and I'm going to touch on a few of my favorite moments. As part two opens, we learn through Hamor's breathless summary that Jephthah has been victorious and Iphis prepares to welcome her father. While no one else is aware of Jephthah's vow, as the audience, we can see disaster coming a mile off. After Iphis and a chorus of virgins greet Jephthah with the delightful air, welcome as the cheerful light, Jephthah responds in horror and confusion that is further underscored by the evocative air that follows, open the marble jaws, O tomb. Let's listen to the end of the chorus, Jephthah's response, and the opening of open the marble jaws. A few interesting things to note about this sequence. The heartfelt joy of the chorus with energetic string accompaniment moving into Jephthah's realization and a restative with no orchestra. Handel is really placing a focus on the words rather than using music to provide the feelings. And then the disjunct scattered open the marble jaws, which really brings his agitation to light.
upon my tasteless ears. Be gone, my child, thou hast undone thy father. Fly, be gone, and leave me to the rack of wild despair. Even more heart-wrenching is Iphis's response to her impending demise in the remarkable air, Happy They, singing first alone and then gradually with the orchestra. And if I am discussing remarkable arias, I have to mention Jephthah's gorgeous air, Waft Her Angels Through the Skies, in which a father's love for his daughter is on full display, as he also resolves to fulfill his promise to God, however terrible it may be. This comes from our 1988 performance with tenor Anthony Rolf Johnson. The rest of the music I'm using comes from a 2011 recording with Fabio Biondi in the Stavanger Orchestra featuring James Gilchrist, who made his music of the Baroque debut last season as Jephthah. Jane Glover recently told Wynne Delacoma in a preview of this, these performances of Jephthah for Chicago Classical Review that she would like waft her angels sung at her funeral. Finally, one of the most important ingredients in Jephthah is the chorus, which as always plays an incredibly important role throughout the oratorio, as Jane Glover notes. And then there are the choruses. 
which are partly um, participant, but also, like the St Matthew Passion, partly commenting. He loved writing for good choral singers, which he had in London. He, it was the combination of the choirs of Westminster Abbey, St Paul's Cathedral and the Chapel Royal. Um, and therefore they were extremely good at counterpoint and complex singing, as is the music of the Baroque chorus. So expect some really magnificent and uh, challenging but dramatically uh, viable and relevant choral singing. Perhaps most poignant is the chorus, How Dark Thy Lord Are Thy Decrees. Handel changes Morel's original text, What God Ordains is Right, to Alexander Pope's powerful statement in an essay on man, Whatever is, is right. It is nearly impossible not to read Handel's sorrow over his own situation into the lengthy chorus, packed with both a sense of resolve and incredible pathos. And remember, it was at this point that the pain in his eyes forced Handel to stop working. countless examples of Handel's use of music to bring the drama to life or add significant interpretive nuances. If I went through them all, Baroque notes could quite possibly reach Wagnerian proportions. In talking through some of the examples, my hope is that it will help tune your ear to listen for these fascinating connections between text and music, not only where the music intensifies a drama, but also when the music doesn't necessarily do what you might expect. Despite his health challenges, Handel was able to conduct Jephthah's premiere at Covent Garden on February 26, 1752, as well as two subsequent repetitions that season. It was to be one of his final appearances directing his ensemble. During his remaining years, while he is said to have continued the tradition of playing organ concertos during his oratorios, he no longer appeared as conductor and was greatly troubled by his sight. According to historian Charles Burney, Handel was always much disturbed and agitated during the aria Total Eclipse and Samson, as were all onlookers. The recollection that Handel had set this air to music with the view of the blind composer then sitting by the organ affected the audience so forcibly that many persons present were moved even to tears. Handel died on April 14, 1759. Jephthah is truly a remarkable work, and I hope my comments have helped make what I know will be a profound listening experience even a little more meaningful. Thank you so much. Welcome as the light. Welcome as the light.